This reading is taken from 2 Samuel chapter 7. Second Samuel chapter 7, the Lord's covenant with David. Now when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, Therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me thus far? And yet this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord God. You have spoken also of your servant's house for a great while to come. And this is instruction for mankind, O Lord God. And what more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O Lord God. Because of your promise and according to your own heart, you have brought about all this greatness to make your servant know it. Therefore, you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, and there is no God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth whom God went to redeem to be his people, making himself a name and doing for them great and awesome things by driving out before your people whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt a nation and its gods. And you established for yourself, your people Israel, to be your people forever. And you, O Lord, became their God. And now, O Lord God, confirm forever the word that you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, and do as you have spoken. And your name will be magnified forever, saying, the Lord of hosts is God over Israel. And the house of your servant David will be established before you. For you, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have made this revelation to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. Therefore, your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. And now, O Lord God, you are God and your words are true and you have promised this good thing to your servant. Now, therefore, may it please you to bless the house of your servant so that it may continue forever before you. 
for you, O Lord God, have spoken, and with your blessing shall the house of your servant be blessed forever. Morning everyone, nice to be with you. Let's, let's pray before we start this time in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Father, we thank you that your promises are, are steadfast and secure. Oh Lord, we praise you for your goodness and kindness. That means that we can, we can know what your will is. We can know what you want for this world and for our lives every time we come to the scriptures. And so we pray as we, as we uh, reflect and meditate on what you've said to us in this amazing passage of the Bible, that you would conform our will to yours. Help us to live our lives in keeping with the promises that you have made for your glory and our good. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder if you've ever asked yourself the question, uh, what gets God up in the morning? Right, what gets God out of bed in the morning? Now, the chances are you never have because it's a silly question because God doesn't sleep. Right? God, God doesn't. The Bible is clear on that, actually. He doesn't go to bed. He doesn't get up in the morning. But you know what I'm saying when we ask that question. What gets you out of bed in the morning? It's a way of asking uh, what motivates you? What drives you? What are your priorities that get you going? And actually, when you think about it, it becomes a really important question to ask of God. What gets him out of bed in the morning? What are his priorities? Because if, as we ask that question, we discover that his priorities are very different to our priorities, well, that should give us pause uh, for thought. Uh, you hear people say it's a common phrase these days. People talk about being on the wrong side of history. It's a very powerful phrase because nobody wants to be on the wrong side of history. Well, if as you ask the question, what gets God out of bed in the morning, you discover that his priorities aren't your priorities, then in effect, what you're discovering is that you are on the wrong side of history because he's the one who determines what the right side of history is. A different way of asking the same question, what gets God out of bed in the morning, would be to ask, what is it that means God will one day rest? And what is it that means... Uh, one day he might, so what, would, what would make him sit down and say, that's it, the job's done. Relax, everybody. We've come to a conclusion. Because that, I think, is the question that King David is asking as we meet him at the beginning of 2 Samuel chapter 7. You see, since the beginning of 1 Samuel, or at least halfway through 1 Samuel, we were introduced to King David. And everything about King David has been, been great. Uh, he has demonstrated himself to be humble and submissive to God and to be attentive to his voice. That was what set him apart from Saul. Saul was proud, arrogant and loved the sound of his own voice, not David. David listened to God's voice. And ever since halfway through 1 Samuel, David's star has been on the rise, slowly but surely working towards the throne with God's help. And now we saw this last week in 2 Samuel chapter 6, David has pretty much been established uh, he is recognized by all in his kingdom as God's king. And he's living in Jerusalem, which is the capital city of, uh, of God's kingdom. And last week we saw him bring in the Ark of the Covenant. Nothing less than bringing in the very presence of God. And the author of 2 Samuel has been showing us the rise of this king and his kingdom to help us see what it really looks like when God's king is established and everything is well in the world. And that's what it is like for David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. His kingdom's established, everything is well in his world. He's described as having rest in verse 1, which is a very powerful Bible word. He has rest. But David is nervous because whilst he feels like he has rest, he looks around him and everything is dandy, he's beginning to wonder... Well, does God have rest? Uh, surely this is the moment that God should settle down as well. And he's uncomfortable because he recognizes he has a house of cedar whilst God is living in a tent. Do you see verse one? And now when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, see now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Nathan, the, the prophet, the mouthpiece of God in his kingdom says, sounds fair enough. I understand what you're thinking, David. Sounds like a good plan. Crack on, go for it. 
But what becomes quickly obvious as you read on in 2 Samuel is that actually at this moment at least, God's plans and David's plans are not lined up with each other. Temporarily at least, David finds himself on the wrong side of history. God says to David, no, look, now is not the time for me to settle down, as it were. This is not the moment that I'm going to put down roots in this one place. This is not the moment I'm going to put my feet up and say, everybody rest, the job's done. He says to David, look, David, your horizons are far too small. If you think that this is the end of the story, you on a throne with this particular group of people in this particular place established, if you think that's the end of the story, you've got another thing coming. I have a much, much bigger plan than that. And what comes next in 2 Samuel chapter 7 is a key chapter in the Bible. Uh, If you read through the whole of the Bible story, then 2 Samuel 7 is one of those key chapters that the Bible keeps coming back to again and again. It's like a foundation stone that the whole of the Bible story rests on. And in it, we discover God's blueprint for everything he wants to do in his world. Or to put it in different terms, we discover what gets God out of bed in the morning. God says to David, David, you you haven't seen the half of it. You haven't seen the half of it. I've got so much more planned. He he sends the word through Nathan, his prophet, and you get in verse eight what he's to say. Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant, David, verse eight, thus says the Lord of hosts. I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. David, we've made a good start together, but you need to know it is just a start. He says, I took you from the pastures, but then he goes on, verse 9, I will make you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. David, just coming to the the throne of Israel, that's just the beginning. I'm going to make your name so great that everybody in the earth is going to know about it. He says, I made you prince over my people. Yes, I've done that. But verse 10, I've got more in store for them too. He says, I will appoint a place for them, uh, for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. Uh, I've got a great plan for you. I've got a great plan for your people and I've got a great plan for your enemies as well. He says, yes, in the past I have cut off your enemies, but now halfway through verse 11, he says, I will give you rest from all your enemies. Again, there's that word rest that speaks of a a permanence in God's plans. David, my plans for you and everyone else are bigger and better and more secure and more lasting. You haven't seen anything yet. And to get the full weight of exactly what God is saying to David here, we just need to pause and step back a bit from 2 Samuel 7. We need to, as it were, see where this passage fits in, in the full flow of the Bible story up until this point. We need to go back to the very beginning of God's promises to humanity, to the very first covenant that he made with Abraham. Uh, Abraham, we, we meet in Genesis chapter 12. Uh, You'll know, I'm sure, Genesis is the first book of the Bible. And and, and in it, you have both the creation story and then the fall of humanity in Adam and Eve. And by Genesis chapter 12, the world is a really, really messy place. But in Genesis 12, God speaks to Abraham and he says to him, look, I've got I've got a plan. I'm going to make you promises to mend this broken world. They're going to center in on you. Genesis 12, he says to Abraham, I'm going to make your name great. And you hear the echo of that in 2 Samuel 7 as he speaks to David. And he says, I'm going to do that by giving you many, many descendants, a great people, first of all. He says, Abraham, you are going to have more descendants than the stars in the sky and then the sand on the seashore. Many, many people. And I'm going to put them in a perfect place. I'm going to plant them in a place of peace and prosperity and security. And best of all, you, Abraham, and your descendants are going to enjoy my presence with you in a way that means these people in this place are going to enjoy a perfect peace and security once and for all. Uh, Their enemies are going to be dealt with in a lasting fashion. He says, look, Abraham, your descendants are going to be in a a place where there'll be no uh, no more fighting. 
There'll be no more war. There'll be no more division. There'll be no more racism. There'll be no more sexism. There'll be no more abuse. None of those things will exist. There'll be no more anxiety. There'll be no more fear. There'll be no more insecurity. There'll be no more justice. And now as we move from Genesis 12 and hear the echoes of all of those promises in 2 Samuel 7 to David, God says to him as well, there's going to be no more elections. No more elections. Not in my kingdom anyway, says God, because now you, David, my king, are going to be at the centre of this kingdom because those verses that we just looked at in 2 Samuel chapter 7, you, you may have noticed that on either side of the promise concerning the prosperity and the peace and the security of God's people, on either side of them is a promise concerning the king. So verse 9, God said, I'm going to make your name great, David. And then in verse 11, halfway through verse 11, he says, I'm going to give you rest from all of your enemies. And so sandwiched between two great promises to the king are the promises of prosperity and peace for the people. It's God's way of saying that from now on, the blessing and peace of the people is going to be tied up inexorably with the peace and security of God's king. From now on, he's saying, my plans for my kingdom are going to have a king at the center of them. And that forever. Forever. This is going to be an eternal reality. Because as God goes on making these promises through Nathan, we begin to discover that the, the plans that God is making are not limited by the life expectancy of David. It's going to spill out beyond him. So verse 12, he says when uh, or halfway through verse 11, moreover, moreover, he says, look, there's more. Don't don't just settle on that. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house uh, you've said to him, I, I want to build you a house, a building, literally, to, for you to dwell in. He says, I'm going to make you a house, by which he means a, a dynasty, a line of descent, children who will come from your body. Verse 12, he says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever and God says look this line is going to come from you and even if the sons that you have and their sons even if they stuff up even if they happen to be unrighteous maybe like Saul was that isn't going to derail my plans because he goes on verse 15 he says even if that happens my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul whom I put away from before you and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Three times that word comes up in these promises. This is going to be a forever reality now. God is saying there will in my eternal kingdom be an eternal king who will sit on the throne so what is it that gets God out of bed in the morning? Well, the answer well, we find in the promises that he makes. And here we see him make promises for an eternal kingdom with a king at the heart of it. So God's desire to establish this kingdom is the driving force. It is his motivation. It is his greatest priority. It's why when you think about it, when, when Jesus talks to his disciples about what to pray for, he says to them, pray these words, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God most of all wants his kingdom established on earth in the way that it already exists in heaven. And, and not just a kingdom in a sort of vague sense of the word. You often hear people talking about the kingdom of God and, and equating it with well, almost anything good that's going on in the world, that's an expression of the kingdom of God when you see it happening. But here we see that God's kingdom is only realised when God's king is at the heart of it. He's talking to David here and his line of descent. He's saying that's what's going to be at the centre of my kingdom. God's kingdom can only exist when God's king is acknowledged rightly as the king at the heart of that universe. And only when that's achieved fully and finally in a lasting and universal way only then will God say now I'm ready to rest now I'll put down roots on the earth 
If you're asking what the right or the wrong side of history looks like, well, here's your answer in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And it might be you're tuning in this morning and you think, this is, this, is, this is very interesting. I'm beginning to see something of how the Bible story fits together with 2 Samuel 7 as a key chapter in it. But what difference does it make? And, and it, uh, this seems quite unique or quite niche. Okay, God's interested in this king and this kingdom. What's that got to do with my life, this unique figure who's going to be at the heart of his plans? All sounds a bit distant, perhaps. But it's not at all, because in fact, these promises are at the heart of what we long for in our world. On Wednesday, was it Wednesday we went to the voting booth? Uh, lots of us went into polling stations and we put a little X in a box. And in that act of putting an X in a box, a little part of us was hoping that we would vote for someone who just might, just might be able to make the difference in London. Someone who could lead us into a glorious golden age of prosperity for our city. After all, those were the promises that they were making. And when we put that X in the box, there's a little part of us that's hoping for exactly that. We're looking for a leader who can guarantee peace and prosperity on our streets. Or maybe on Friday night, you sat down and you watched one of the many, many, many Marvel movies with a different superhero at the heart of every story. There are too many to count, but the storyline is always the same, isn't it? Everything goes wrong with the world and some kind of superhero rises up and they win the day and they establish a place of peace and security for people. Now, the, the, the reason that story keeps on getting told, the reason we're such suckers for these Marvel movies with the same storyline again and again and again is because it touches on something deep in us. We escape into these worlds and love doing that because they touch on something very deep within. That is a longing for a leader who can rise up and bring peace and prosperity. Might be that uh, in the last few weeks you have signed up for some kind of self-improvement schedule or technique or course or something like that. Uh, maybe you've signed up for something that's going to get you fit. Maybe you've signed up for something that's going to help you organize your life better. Again, when we sign up for those courses, there's just a little part of us that is hoping that perhaps we can be the leader who can rise up and secure our own lives and bring in a prosperity and a peace that we're lacking. The simple fact is that again and again, all of us is looking for someone great. Someone who's got a great name who can bring in for us peace and prosperity. The problem that we have is that we keep on looking in the wrong place for it. 2 Samuel 7 says to us, you should go looking for someone who is from the line of David. Go looking for someone who is of the line of David. Go looking for someone of whom God says, this is my son who I love. Go looking for someone whose life expectancy means that they can sit on a throne forever. If you find that one, then you have found the one who can deliver on all of these promises that we're seeing in the Bible story. We are, you, are, you are seeing the one who is at the heart of God's plans for the universe and you are seeing what the right side of history looks like. And of course, I don't have to say it really, it's so obvious, but the Bible story as it goes on sees all of the threads coming together in one place, don't they? Uh, it sees all of the roads leading in one direction towards Jesus Christ. The one who is described as the son of David, the one who is described as the son of God, the one who has raised, been raised from the dead in a way that means he will live forever and can sit on the throne of the universe forever. This is what gets God out of bed in the morning. This is the one who he has put at the center of his plans for an eternal kingdom. And it might take a little bit of thinking to go from that kind of big scale, that, that meta narrative across not just the, 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 the arc of the whole Bible story, but really the arc of the whole of history to bring that to bear on our lives day to day. But a good way of doing that would be to ask yourself the question, maybe now as you're thinking or maybe tomorrow morning as you get up and begin your day with the Lord to ask yourself the question, what will it look like to line my life up with God's plan? Or differently, what will it look like for me to get myself on the right side of history? And if you want to go 
one step more practical and grounded than that, then you could ask yourself the question, how can I shape my prayer life around God's plan? Uh, often it's quite revealing, isn't it? You look at your prayer life, what it is you pray for when you have those moments, either under pressure or in those moments where you've carved out a bit more time. You ask yourself, what does my prayer life look like? Well, that's the question that we can ask because it's the question in a sense that David asks as he walks from his house into the tabernacle to be in the presence of God. This week at Groups, we're in John 17. It's this amazing chapter of John's gospel where we get a glimpse into the prayer life of Jesus Christ, where we get to see Jesus, the, the son of God, praying to his father. Uh, if you caught the recap video to, to tee up the Bible study, you'd have heard Sam talking about how or imagining what it would be like to be in one of our uh, uh, monthly prayer meetings on Zoom and for Jesus Christ to arrive. Uh, you see him there, his screen just pops up. It says in the bottom corner, Jesus Christ. And you can't quite believe it, but it's really him. And then you discover you're in the breakout room, but breakout room with him and he begins to pray. And you're thinking to yourself, this is amazing. I can't wait to see what the prayer life of Jesus Christ, the son of God looks like. And then he begins to pray. Well, this moment in 2 Samuel 7 from verses 18 to 29, the second half of the chapter is a moment not unlike that. We get a glimpse into the prayer life of the first king of Israel, the Messiah, the Christ, uh, the first son of God, as it were. And as we read these prayers, John 17 or 2 Samuel chapter 7, it is quite exposing, I think. Uh, you could do worse than tomorrow morning. Sit down with this prayer and ask yourself the question, how do, do my prayers and priorities and praises, how do they line up with David's? And we'll find perhaps there are significant differences because this is a prayer here that is perfectly in keeping with God and perfectly in keeping with his priorities. David starts in verses 18 and 19 by saying, look, I take God, having heard everything you said, I take your point. My, my priorities were out of line with yours. My horizon was far too small. You've got something much bigger planned and in mind. Verse 18, then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, who am I, O Lord? And what is my house that you have brought me thus far? And yet this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord God. You have spoken also of your servant's house for a great while to come. And this is instruction for mankind, O Lord God. David is, is like his jaw has dropped because of what he's heard from from the Lord. And he says, I'm beginning to realize all of a sudden that you are speaking about an eternal reality that has significance and relevance for everybody. My horizons were limited to this moment in time and this little this little patch of land in this moment and this little group of people. But you've blown my horizons wide open. He says the scale and the, the scope of these promises are, are, are huge. And now he says, first of all, what I most want to do is simply to praise you. You see verse 20, he says, what more can David say to you? What more can I say? I'm lost for words, he says. But then he goes on, you see verse 22, he says, therefore, in the light of everything I've heard, therefore, you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you and there is no God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. If these promises come true, God, that means you are incomparable and worthy of all praise. And then he goes on, verse 23, the nation that you have made for yourself is great, not because of anything that nation has done, but because you're great. Verse 23, who is like your people, Israel, the one nation on earth whom God went to redeem to be his people, making himself a name and doing for them great and awesome things by driving out before your people whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt, a nation and its gods. This is the right response of the king. He says, I'm going to line up my priorities with your priorities so that what spills out is a life of praise. He says, I just want to praise you. And then he goes on and says, and now I just want what you want. Someone very wise once said that, that Christian prayer is not so much about conforming God's will to ours, so much as it is about conforming our will to his. You see what they're saying there? 
Often we come and pray and say, God, would you mind shifting your priorities so that they're in line with what I want? But Christian prayer is about lining up our priorities with his, conforming our will to his will. And that's exactly what David does in verse 25. He says, now, uh, Lord, O Lord God, confirm forever the word that you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house and do as you have spoken and your name will be magnified forever, saying the Lord of hosts is God over Israel. David says, you've made me this promise that you're going to make my name great. Now, Lord, act in keeping with the word that you've spoken. That means that your name will be great in the end. I want to praise you. I want what you want. And then he says very simply, I just want to serve you. Did you see the, the repeated words from verse 25 onwards that gives us a clue as to how David feels about himself? Just glance down. I think this word comes up nine times in nine verses. Just cast your eye down from verse 25. See if you can see the repeated word. The title that David takes for himself. Did you see it? Servant. Servant. David has just been promised that he and his line of descendants are going to be at the very centre of God's plans and purposes for the whole world. You would forgive him for having a slightly inflated ego at this point. Right? You would understand if he began to think a little bit about some of the perks and privileges that are going to come from being at the centre of God's plans, of being his king sat on his throne uh, in a lasting way. But David is not self-interested at all as if to really ram the point home again and again and again, he simply describes himself as God's servant. This is what God's king is like at the moment he discovers he's at the center of God's plans. And like I said a few moments ago, there's loads that we can learn from this prayer and loads that we can use to shape our own prayer life. How often does your prayer life spill out in praise the way that David's does? How often do you scour God's word to hear what he says first and then say, Lord, do this, do this. You've promised you'll do it. I'd love you to do that. But in the end, I think this prayer isn't here first and foremost to shape our prayer lives. It is here to show us the heart of the king who prays it. Because this prayer is saying to us, look at the heart of God's eternal kingdom that he promises here in 2 Samuel chapter 7 is a king whose heart is perfectly aligned with God's. This is what we need if these promises are going to come true. A king whose heart is perfectly aligned with God's. You see, the problem we have, I think, when we go looking for leaders uh, whether it's leaders we find in the political realm or in the realm of popular culture or sports or even when we look at ourselves for leadership. The problem we come up against again and again is that none of those leaders have their wills perfectly lined up with God's. None of those leaders can say, I have a hotline to God. I am most concerned for him and his priorities. That's what I love most of all. We never find that. And yet that really is what we need most of all. And so at this key moment in the Bible story, 2 Samuel chapter 7, God's covenant with David, we get a window into the soul of the king that we need most of all. And when the true Christ comes... When the one who is at the end of these promises to David, the true son of David, the true son of God, the Christ, when he comes into the world, we see exactly these priorities expressed in his life. You saw them on Wednesday evening or Thursday evening in John chapter 17. He says very simply, your will be done. Not my will, but your will. You see, at the heart of these verses, there's a call to us said, didn't we, when uh, we discover what gets God out of bed in the morning, we discover what the right side of history looks like. And implicitly, therefore, and explicitly in the rest of the Bible story, there's a call to us that says to us, are you going to be on the right side of history or the wrong side of history? Are you going to get out of bed in the morning for the same reasons that God gets out in the morning? Are you going to rest for the same reasons that he rests in the end? But as that call comes to us, let's be under no illusions, that is a big call to make. 
often it's going to require real cost and real sacrifice. And I know that there are people at this moment who are weighing up exactly that. Am I going to make the costly decision in order to follow Jesus and live life in his kingdom? Or am I in the end just going to go my way and do my thing? Well, here in these verses, we see shadowed the one who, when he comes, shows us that his will lines up perfectly with God's will in a way that means he truly can bring in the kingdom of God today and lastingly in God's glorious new creation. Here we see the one who gets God out of bed in the morning. And we should think to ourselves, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for these promises. They tell us what you're most concerned about and they help us understand your will because you've promised them. And we're so grateful that we stand on the other side of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ in a way that means we've seen these words beginning to be fulfilled. Your king has been established and now he sits on the throne of the universe and it's just a matter of time before his kingdom comes in fully and finally. And so we ask, Lord, that we would line up our will with your will, that we would be able to say uh, with King David, would your word be accomplished? And that we'd be able to pray that, Lord, not just for the world in a general sense, but for ourselves in a specific sense. Would we be able to say with Jesus, not our will, but your will? Would we be able to pray with integrity, your kingdom come and your will be done? And we ask, Lord, that as we do that, so you would help us to enjoy all of the blessings of life in your kingdom. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.